Okay, then uh, let's start. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the, this long delay, but uh, you you will have 30 minutes extra time due to the delay. So, don't worry. The 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 seminar will hold as uh, as planned. Just shifted by 30 minutes. 30 minutes, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Gray Milton from the Department of Mathematics in University of Utah. So uh, Graham is uh, very famous for his bounce with together with uh, David Bergman and uh, many, many stuff in composites. So basically I heard uh, about the work from Graham actually in uh, any kind, uh, any field of uh, metamaterials in electromagnetism, acoustics, thermoelasticity and many others. And it's my pleasure to have him uh, with us today. So, Graham, please, it's your turn, and Bogdan will just start recording. Uh, recording. Well, thanks, Morma, and uh, and I also apologize for the delay in uh, getting things working. Um, anyway, uh, it's great to see many familiar faces, or at least names, on the list. Um, yeah, so this is uh, talk is divided up into two parts. Um, the first part with Christian Kern and Onella Matai um, on um, uh, going back to all, the old results of uh, uh, David Bergman and myself and, uh, um, and looking at two aspects. One is uh, actually improving the results, the bounds, and secondly, trying to uh, explore um, how good they are. And the second one is uh, um, instead of looking at constant frequency fields, we look at the uh, fields which vary with time. Um, okay. Um, and that second part is with uh, Owen, Owen Miller. Uh, sorry, Onella sorry. Matai. Next page. Yeah. And yeah, okay. Yeah, These are okay. authors. Um, um, the uh, the uh, interesting thing is uh, with Mihai, um, I guess the happiness of the soul a greater. That's when he was in Singapore and had to grade hundreds of exams by himself. But uh, hey, let's next page. <laughs> next page. Yeah, so um, I'm sure all of you are sort of familiar that uh, um, materials have responses that are not instantaneous. Uh, and because of this, uh, one has a non-local response between uh, fields. So in particular, um, we have this sort of relation between the current or displacement field on the left and the electric field on the right, and they're linked by some integral kernel. Um, and then if we're interested in a two-phase composite, that integral kernel splits up into the integral kernel in phase one, the integral kernel in phase two, um, and uh, then there's this uh, uh, chi of x, and chi of x here is just the indicator function. So that takes the values one in phase one and zero in phase two. So that's just saying that k takes the value k1, k phase one, k2, and phase two. Um, but now if, if we go to um, the frequency domain, next page, um, then uh, um, one has that uh, um, instead of k, one has the uh, dielectric constant uh, epsilon, um, which takes the value epsilon one in phase one and epsilon two in phase two, and these in general matrix valued or tensor valued uh, functions. Um, and they're the Fourier transforms of K1 and K2. Um, so um, let's now assume that omega fricks does just drop it from the formula. Next page. Um, and uh, okay. Um, and I think uh, anyone that's seen uh, the Next Utopian website, for example, is familiar with this uh, Lysurgis cup, um, which you can see in the British Museum. And uh, it has the remarkable property that uh, um, from the side, at, uh, outside, at, uh, lit in front, it looks green, but lit behind, it looks red. Um, 
And this is an example of uh, metal particles uh, giving rise to different colored glasses. Um, and uh, well, it's unclear that the uh, Romans um, really understood this. Um, I mean, uh, um, probably they did have an idea that there was some metal particles, but not the uh, optics, of course. Uh, next page. Um, yes, yeah, so there's this old paper of Max um, that actually provided, so this is 1904, uh, that provided the uh, theory um, for these uh, um, uh, glasses containing metal particles. And it's sort of interesting, Maxwell Garnet got his name because his father worked with James Fluke Maxwell, and uh, he was so impressed with uh, uh, Maxwell that he named his son after him. So anyway, the uh, continued on the tradition. Next page. Um, and, and so Maxwell Garner obtained this formula for the effective dielectric constant um, in terms of the dielectric constant of uh, one phase, that's epsilon 1, and the dielectric constant of the background medium, that's epsilon 0. And F1 and F2 are the volume fractions of the phases. They just add up to 1. And, and that has a long history too uh, with many people involved in that, um, and uh, including Maxwell himself, um, but it was Maxwell Glanet who apl applied this formula to uh, uh, glasses containing metals, metal particles. And, uh, and there it was subject to a lot of debate, but actually Raleigh in 1892 placed it on solid ground, showing that it was valid uh, for... Um, regular rays when they were in the dilute limit. And there's this nice history in 1978 by Landauer um, that uh, um, you should all have a look at if you want to sort of dig around the history of this sort of things. And uh, um, so um, one nice thing about the history is it actually mentions that Masotti, uh, you'll notice 1846 to 1850, he actually finished the paper in 1846, but he, then he got imprisoned um, after taking his uh, uh, students to war. Um, anyway, uh, so that got delayed. Next page, please. Um, so um, there's actually an exact formula here. Um, and I'm not sure why that didn't show up. Um, Maybe try the next page. Oh, there we are. It just takes a while. Um, sorry, back. Um, yeah, so uh, this is a, uh, it's called an assemblage of coded spheres uh, with the uh, spheres filling, uh, coded spheres filling all space of all different sizes. And for that particular geometry, Cashin and Strickman found out that the approximation is exact. And um, so here's for the conductivity, which is directly analogous to the dielectric constant. <laughs> and the main idea of this is that uh, uh, a coded sphere like that is a neutral inclusion. You can insert it in a medium of the right dielectric constant, sigma naught, uh, in such a way as not to disturb the surrounding uh, field. So it's a basically invisible. And then you can add more and more of them to fill all space. And at the same time, the uh, conductivity remains equal to sigma naught. And so in the limit can be identified with the effective conductivity. Next page. Um, and then there's, you can sort of, uh, be, be back please. You can identify this with, uh, um, uh, um, okay, the, you can generalize this idea to doubly coded spheres or multi coded sphere assemblages. Um, and uh, then there's this sort of continued fraction formula that you get. You just sort of repeat the idea, it's sort of straightforward. Next page. And uh, so that's actually sort of nice work by Naomi Halifax's group quite a while ago now. 
um, who uh, worked with uh, gold nanoshells, so precisely this same sort of idea, uh, at uh, um, different uh, ratios of the um, um, core of the uh, whole volume to the uh, um, um, volume of the shell. And, uh, and and then you actually get sort of a range of colors then. You could sort of continually uh, adjust that. And, uh, and this sort of corresponds to having particles with resonances at uh, a range of frequencies. Next page, please. And uh, so a natural uh, thing to ask is uh, what is the range of possible properties you can get as the uh, microstructure is varied. Um, and so this is the um, one that uh, myself and David Bergman tackled uh, in 1980. Um, actually, I guess we worked on it in 1979. Um, I was a undergraduate. David Bergman was working in Schlumberger and uh, um, I guess this is taking a while to download. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so you can sort of see here there's sort of uh, circles in the complex plane. Uh, the axis is a real part of the effective permittivity and the imaginary part of the effective permittivity. Um, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. Uh, they're the uh, dielectric constants of the two phases. Roughly, the imaginary part corresponds to the absorption in those materials, and the real part is related to how they sort of bend light, if you like, the refractive index of them. Um, and then, uh, if you know nothing about the geometry, not even that it's isotropic, it's the effective parameter is confined to this region omega. More precisely, um, the effective dielectric constant, if you look at any diagonal element of that matrix, uh, it's confined to the region omega. And then the uh, straight line between epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, that's just an average of the two. Uh, and so that sort of corresponds to a layered material um, with the field parallel to the layers. And the uh, remaining arc of omega uh, that passes through the origin corresponds to the layers um, with the um, uh, uh, field perpendicular to the layers. And then if you uh, know, if you go back, sorry. If you, uh, and then if you know the volume fraction is confined to omega prime, um, and then the optimal geometries are assemblages of coated ellipsoids. And then uh, if you uh, know that the material is uh, isotropic, and that'll be our focus, then it's confined to these other two lens-shaped regions in, that are marked by the crosshatches, depending on if you're in uh, two and three, dim three dimensions. Uh, next page, please. And so the basic... Uh, um, theory behind that is that uh, if we look at this particular function f, um, and remember f1, small f1 is the volume fraction of phase one, um, then that's sort of related to what are called Markov functions. Uh, and in particular, if you introduce this variable z, which is this ratio there, um, then uh, f of z has this sort of integral representation um, where we're integrating over lambda um, and you weight it by this measure d mu of lambda. Um, and then on the uh, denominator, you've got lambda minus c. Um, so if those sort of functions have the key problem, if you like, that if uh, z has a positive imaginary part, um, then it's sort of easy to see that uh, f of z has positive imaginary part. And for composite materials, that those sort of properties are natural because they tell one that uh, if, the, if the phases absorb energy, then the composite may, must absorb energy too. Um, 
And then, uh, um, so that uh, uh, theory actually that was pioneered by David in 1978, um, there were some errors um, that I corrected in 1981. Um, and then a, a rig rigorous uh, derivation was given by Golden Papanicola in 1983. Um, and then, uh, um, um, a, Varying mu, in some sense, corresponds to varying the geometry. And so the idea is to um, find the range that f takes as mu varies over all um, positive measures. Um, and this actually only gives out of bounds because some measures may not correspond to any microgeometries. Um, and these sort of uh, lens-shaped bounds actually have a long history um, that we were not aware of it, neither David nor myself, and, and actually a lot of other physicists, uh, in particular people working on Pade approximates, such as uh, Baker and uh, uh, Graves Morris and uh, um, uh, many others. Uh, anyway, they go back to 1916 or 1919. Um, next page, please. So let's go back. So now I'm just focusing on the, those crosshatched regions, but in the 3D case, um, we have this uh, region omega double prime, and here we just take in sample values of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 and the volume fraction. And now the question is, is what is what portion of those bounds is filled by microstructures? Next slide, please. Um, Next slide. So um, one side of the bound is given by this formula epsilon star plus. Um, and uh, the key thing you sort of notice about epsilon star plus is that it's, of course, just a um, rational function. Um, and it... Uh, um, U1 and U2 are actually um, just parameters such as U1 plus U2 equals 1. Um, but the uh, key thing you notice is that the, um, there's only one pole of that function. Um, and so in, in looking for one should therefore search for microstructures with this single pole. And uh, here we go. Here's... Uh, um, some microstructures which have a single pole in their response. Um, and, uh, um, okay, the coded uh, uh, this assemblage, the coded cylinder assemblage, and the lamp assemblage. The last two are anisotropic, uh, but there was a trick that Schulgasser noticed is that you can actually get from them a isotropic material um, just by taking the, uh, uh, which has exactly the uh, effective uh, dielectric constant, which is uh, uh, the average of the dielectric constants in the three directions. Um, next page, please. And so with that, um, one actually can identify five points on the boundary of that top arc that correspond to geometries. Next page, please. Um, and of course, there's gaps here. And the question is, is um, what's happening in those gaps? And can you ad identify additional microstructures attaining the bounds? Um, and my uh, thought had been um, probably not, uh, but uh, Christian, show that, uh, in fact, you can. Um, next page, please. Sorry, just stay there, I guess. Yeah. Um, one thing um, one can realize is that uh, uh, the geometries of uh, coded spheres or coded cylinders can be actually replaced by what are called sort of hierarchical laminate structures. I actually thought they had been discovered by Schulgasser in the 1970s, but uh, uh, John Willis pointed me out that actually uh, Maxwell uh, had actually uh, uh, come out up with them first. Um, 
Anyway, they have exactly the same responses as these assemblages. So it makes sense, sense to look within the class of these laminated or hierarchical laminate materials to see what you can get. Uh, next page, please. And, uh, and so there's actually these sort of additional three red points that one get on the bounds. And, uh, and these correspond to these uh, hierarchical laminates um, with the layerings just in three orthogonal directions. And it's to be emphasized that the uh, ratio of length scales is, uh, um, yeah, uh, the, uh, from one scale to the next scale, the ideal material should have an infinite ratio of length scales. So, so these are actually not materials that you can easily build, uh, but they serve to demonstrate that the bounds are the best ones possible and actually serve as then a benchmark for um, trying to attain them by more realistic uh, microgeometries. Okay, I'm not sure. Here we go. Um, yeah, so this shows you um, what... Uh, um, what you can sort of fill by these uh, different microgeometries. And uh, yeah, so um, this is taking a little bit longer to uh, um, upload. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, so the different colors just corresponds to uh, the different pairs of materials that one's. Uh, um, mixing it. Uh, and, and so the conclusion is that uh, this upper bound appears to be at least almost optimal, um, but the uh, uh, lower bound, it looks like there's a uh, gap there. And, uh, and so this is, um, yeah, next page, I guess. Yes, and so this is a, a more extreme case, different values of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. And, and it seems now actually there's some significant gaps in the upper uh, half too. So this has not been ex completely ex explored. Um, next page, please. Um, and uh, so now let's look at the uh, second arc. Next page. Um, and so uh, there's this red line. The red line actually corresponds to an assemblage of doubly coded uh, spheres. And that's what we'll be showing as actually the optimal geometry. Next page, please. And uh, actually back in 1980, um, I'd uh, suggested that that was actually not optimal and uh, um, David Bergman made some sort of improvements. Um, one of the reasons why you'd suspect that material is not optimal is that the formula has the property that it suggests the existence of materials uh, where neither phase uh, percolates in the geometry. So, um, it's easy to have a uh, porous rock that the pores are connected and also the rock is connected. Um, or alternatively, a, a geometry of inclusions of one phase in the, in the matrix phase, and they're only in the matrix phase is connected. But you don't expect that there'd be some geometry where neither phase uh, forms a connected phase um, uh, path through the material if there's just two phases present. And so that's why you'd expect this to be uh, improved. So that next page, please. Um, so one way of getting bounds is just using variational methods. Um, so in the, uh, where the uh, permittivity is real valued, um, we're really more interested in the case where it's complex valued, but when it's real valued, there's this variational formula uh, for the effective tensor epsilon star, and uh, where you sort of minimize over trial fields E, um, and those fields E are gradients of potentials, 
or the zero curl, and they have a prescribed average value E naught. And uh, the simplest trial field is just letting E equals E naught. And then you get this sort of arithmetic down for the effective tensor. Epsilon star is less than or equal to the volume averages of epsilon. Um, next page. And uh, so then can we obtain a better bound using variational methods? Um, and uh, the answer is yes. And the key here is to use a transformation of Gibianski and Chikayev. And uh, in this, uh, the idea is just to separate the uh, constitutive law, which involves the displacement electric field linked by the dielectric constant, uh, by its take the real and imaginary parts of that. Um, so D and D prime and D double prime are the real and imaginary parts of the displacement field, and same for the electric field. And then you write this in a constitutive law. Um, it's such that the imaginary parts are on the left and the real parts of the field are on the right, and things minus signs in the right position. And then you end up with this uh, uh, matrix L or this tensor L in the new constitutive law, which is positive semi-definite and real. Um, and so next page, I guess, sorry. Yeah. Um, and so now uh, the arithmetic average is bounds apply, um, except now instead of applying them to L, you apply them to a, uh, a tensor L minus T. T is called a translation, it has special properties. Um, it, uh, um, yeah, anyway, it's a, uh, um, you could take T to be positive definite. Um, that will work, but it won't give you good bounds. The idea is to take T to be uh, a matrix which is positive definite on the set of gradients. Anyway, no need to get into the details of that. Um, and then the second idea is to sort of embed the problem in the sense that uh, um, usually one would think of uh, um, the dielectric constant as being a uh, scalar, um, but then uh, the idea, sorry, the dielectric constant or the constitutive law where the uh, dielectric tensor is a matrix valued um, tensor, uh, but you can actually embed it in a problem where it's a uh, replaced by a fourth order tensor, um, a little bit like elasticity. Um, and that sort of uh, corresponds to the fact of sort of testing the material in different directions. And, uh, um, and then you actually obtain this bound that corresponds to the assemblages of doubly coded spheres. Um, next page, please. Um, so now you can look at uh, uh, dilute suspensions of identically random orientated particles. And the uh, bounds, since they apply to any two-phase composites, they certainly apply to in this dilute case. And then one gets uh, bounds on the uh, polarizability um, of these uh, um, small particles that you have. And uh, not only bounds on the polarizability, but you get bounds on the absorption as well. And uh, these are uh, um, shown in a minute. Uh, and and you actually, in fact, uh, this is sort of an observation I'd made uh, in about 1981 and tested it against the polarizability of, uh, um, of uh, rect uh, square, square uh, inclusions. And and so that's the idea. Uh, there's this sort of simple relationship between the effective permeability epsilon star and the polarizability alpha of the uh, particles. Um, and if they're at random orientations, it's just the trace of alpha which is uh, important. And uh, I get, 
Yeah, so that's it. The balance on the uh, complex permittivity implied balance on the angle average polarizability. Okay, I guess we'll go to the next page. So, um, and the, yeah, and this then applies balance on the uh, ex ex extinction cross section, or basically the sort of absorption, uh, and they improve on uh, uh, balance on the extinction derived by Miller and collaborators, the references at the bottom. Um, but in most cases, the improvement is small. Next page, please. Yeah, so, so now we're uh, on the second part of the talk. We've just considered the response to a single frequency wave. Um, and so that seems natural that uh, uh, non-local convolutions in time just become multiplications. That's why everyone usually goes to the frequency domain. Uh, another uh, uh, common perspective is just to use the response to a delta function or heavy side function, as that then reveals the Green's function. Um, but this raises the uh, question that I think people usually uh, uh, don't study at all um, as to whether more complicated input functions or input signals directly reveal information. Uh, and then how do you design those uh, input uh, signals to do this? Um, yeah, so um, that question is yes. Uh, and we'll see that next page, please. And, uh, okay, the framework we'll use here, we could use the dielectric problem, um, but uh, it makes more sense to look at antiplane elasticity just from a physical viewpoint, um, because the response in elasticity or viscoelasticity are much slower, whereas the responses for electromagnetism are, are very, very fast. Um, and so that makes the experiments uh, much more difficult. Um, relaxation times are incredibly fast for uh, electrical problems um, and not so uh, fast for elasticity. So going back, the, the point is, is that antiplane elasticity, um, you have this sort of uh, cylindrical geometry. Here we've got... Uh, just two phases here, and you're sort of shearing them uh, geometry parallel to the cylinders. And uh, the key uh, quantity of interest is the warping or the displacement in the vertical direction. That's exactly the role of the potential in uh, electrical problems. And, uh, um, and again, you have this non-local response at the bottom, similar to a non-local response in the electrical property. Um, and uh, so now instead of the dielectric constant, you have the shear modulus. Um, so two common experiments that one does uh, in elasticity or antiplane elasticity is a creep experiment. Um, so what you do here is you've got uh, um, the simplest creep experiment is to take a rod of material, stretch it, and uh, keep the... Uh, and then as you've stretched it, keeping the length of the rod the same, you find out that the stress in the rod decreases. Um, oh, sorry, I did that wrong. Um, you uh, um, stretch the rod and you keep the force at the ends of the rod uh, constant. Uh, and then as time goes on, the rod stretches. So that's an example of creep. Um, and uh, so here, this uh, figure here shows the uh, uh, creep as a function of time. So this is antiplane elasticity. This is the shear as a function of time for the composite material. And uh, um, what uh, Ornella and myself were able to do was to get upper and lower bounds 
on this uh, uh, amount of creep, um, again, using these integral representations. And uh, um, so here, um, it's not just the case that uh, uh, phase one or phase two has the uh, maximal or minimal creep, but sometimes it's that which saturates the bound. Um, next page, please. Additional information, such as the volume fraction, um, you find out you get uh, tighter bounds in the time domain. And in particular, what's very interesting here, and you'll notice this occurs at a time of at about 12, is that the uh, green curves almost coincide. Um, so these are uh, using the fact that you know the volume fraction in the component in the composite, and you know it's isotropic. So one can think of this as uh, being used in an inverse way, namely that uh, um, if we make measurements at the time 12 of the response, uh, and we don't know the volume fraction, um, then uh, um, one uh, um, has to choose a volume fraction such that it's compatible the measurements are compatible uh, uh, with the bounds. And, uh, and so in an inverse way, you can do the volume fraction of the two phases. Um, so this is, again, with a very simple heavy side um, um, type input function. Next page. And you can also use uh, uh, the opposite type of uh, uh, experiment. This is sort of stress relaxation experiment. Um, so here you um, take your rod um, or you uh, shear uh, the ma material uh, and you hold the shear fixed um, and then you measure the stress as, as a function of time and the stress decreases. And uh, here we're mixing an elastic material with a viscoelastic material. Um, the elastic material corresponds to a straight line response here. The viscoelasticity material, uh, the response decreases a much of time. And again, you see the bounds collapse here um, at a time of about 0 0.3, um, but also at a time of about 4.3. Next page, please. Um, so it actually looks like you can actually tailor the time dependence of applied fields so that the macroscopic response, in some sense, untangles in time. Um, that's, well, we thought that's very unusual um, because uh, um, the geometry is quite complicated. The responses of the two materials are quite complicated. They depend on what's happened at previous times. Um, and so it seems rather miraculous that uh, um, things could uh, simplify at these specific instants in time. Um, next page, please. Um, so it's actually good news that the bounds collapse um, because that can be used to detect experimental er errors in perfect inf interfaces, impurities or cracks, and, and that other assumptions are, are invalid, or, as I mentioned, to actually determine the volume fraction. Next page, please. So, then a number of questions here. What's the math behind this? And we'll see that's uh, quite uh, uh, simple. Um, and then the second one is how you should choose the input field to ensure appropriate approximate collapse. And then does the analysis extend to bodies containing an inclusion? And the last one is can we determine the shape of the inclusion? Here I'll just follow on the first two. Um, and actually, uh, Third one uh, turns out to be quite easy. The fourth one, you can actually, in fact, determine the shape of the inclusion in uh, theory. Experimentally, it would be still quite di difficult. Uh, um, in some sense, it's sort of you can determine all, all Fourier 
uh, coefficients uh, or the Fourier transform of the inclusion, uh, but from an experimental viewpoint, it's sort of limited to um, recovering the uh, lowest Fourier modes. Next to, uh, slide, please. Uh, so here's an example where it doesn't look like the volumes collapse at all. Again, this is a stress relaxation. One has a heavy side input. Uh, but you notice here that the bounds don't get narrow at any time. And so for this particular model here, or mixture of two materials, one question is, can you redesign the input uh, signal to ensure this collapse? And in fact, you can. Next page, please. And so here you can see, uh, okay, we've actually sort of uh, redesigned things so that at time t equals zero, um, the, uh, uh, there's a collapse that occurs. And uh, of course, this actually extends to, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, response uh, extends to previous times as well, um, but that's not shown here in this uh, figure. Uh, next page, please. Um, so to sort of address why this can be true, one uh, um, can consider the problem mathematical problem. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the response of composite materials are tied to these Markov functions. Um, so inclusion here I've used a small f. f of z uh, is this Markov function and uh, Okay, these Markov functions are also associated with Herglot's ne Nevenliner or Stilte's functions. So um, Herglot's functions are just functions that uh, um, have the property that uh, F has positive imaginary part when Z has positive imaginary part. And uh, they're also called Nevenliner functions. Anyway, all, and there's also Stilte's functions. Basically, these are more or less all equivalent. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, so uh, M naught here is the mass of the measure, which is one. Um, and so we address this following mathematical question. Um, given M points Z1 up to ZM, not on this interval minus one, one, where the um, branch cut of the function is, is, which is where the measure is located, can one find a linear combination of the Fs with uh, coefficients alpha 1 up to alpha m such that the sum, weighted sum, is approximately 1? Well, that's not too difficult, but it should be approximately 1 for all of the positive probability measures mu. Next place, please. And... Uh, I had mentioned this uh, work of Nevenliner Pick uh, dating back to the uh, 1900s. Uh, so they actually provided optimal bounds correlating the values of this M tuple as the measure mu is known. And so, um, so these bounds, in some sense, uh, provide optimal bounds on the range of values that. Uh, S takes as mu varies. Um, so in some sense, that sort of incorporates everything, um, but actually it's not what we're sort of addressing here. Um, so um, next page, please. So in some sense, uh, okay, here we've got these lens-shaped regions. Um, and this is in the uh, plane where the vertical axis is the imaginary part of F, the horizontal is the real part of F. And uh, so these nevenal in a big bounds give the ones this sort of hierarchy of lens-shaped regions. Um, and then as you know, um, F, of, F of Z1, F of Z1 and Z2, F of Z1, Z2, Z3. Um, and the more Fs 
more values of f you know at more and more points, um, you get uh, tighter and tighter bounds. Uh, next page, please. So those bounds uh, can be sort of viewed in a multi-dimensional space as some sort of multi-dimensional clam. Um, so this figure here is very schematic, um, but uh, um, okay, at the bottom, uh, we are interested in the bounds on uh, imaginary part of Z and real part of F of Z. And uh, F of Z1, the uh, vertical axis, well, here I've shown that as just one axis. Um, F of Z1 is actually complex, so somehow that's really two axes. Uh, the real and imaginary part, but uh, but the idea is you've got this sort of clam-shaped things, and if you fix f of z1, that's take, like taking a, a slice through that clam, and then you get this smaller lens-shaped region, and then if you just project, project those down, uh, you get this lens-shaped region within the lens-shaped region. So um, anyway, that's uh, um, the the our problem now has geometrical interpretation, namely, is this multidimensional clam almost flat when one views it from the appropriate directions? And uh, if so, how does one identify these directions? Um, next page, please. Uh, and so mathematically, uh, you want this sort of linear combination of these Fs uh, to be close to one, uh, and uh, um, more precisely, you could take the absolute value of that, take the supremum over all positive measures mu, and you want that to be less than or equal to uh, some small quantity, epsilon m, and uh, epsilon m going to zero as you have more and more points. And, uh, and the nice thing is, is, as you deal with probability measures, um, you know that the uh, extreme values uh, must correspond to measures that are delta functions, um, with a delta function at a point lambda. And, uh, um, and so one's left with just this inequality at the bottom of the page that you need to look at. And, uh, um, and of course, one can rearrange the quantity in the absolute values uh, to be just a ratio of two polynomials. Next page, please. And uh, so that's what we do here. Um, we just write things as some sort of ratio of polynomials, uh, R of lambda, and uh, the denominator is this Q of lambda. Um, so Q of lambda is known. We assume all the points Z, J are known. Um, and and uh, P of lambda, that's what we need to find. That's the uh, denominator here. Um, and then once we know R of lambda, then the alpha case is just the residues. Um, so we need to choose this P of lambda such that the ratio is close to 1. And then we end up with the supremum uh, of uh, the absolute value of P of lambda minus Q of lambda over Q of lambda. Q of lambda is known, and so basically we need to choose P of lambda close to Q of lambda. And then that's just polynomial approximation on the interval between minus 1 and 1. And, uh, um, and so uh, then the alpha K is given by the residues. And in particular, one can use Chebyshev polynomials. Next page, please. And uh, and so actually, you actually have this theorem that uh, um, if these alpha ch k chosen at the like, bottom in terms of these Chebyshev polynomials, one actually has convergence, and the bounds uh, get tighter and tighter um, as the number of uh, points or as the number of frequencies increases. Next page, please. 
And so this is in applications. You have an input function uh, with a selection of frequencies, omega k. Here we've just got a finite number of frequencies. And then at uh, a given time t0, uh, uh, one actually has a... Um, um, T0 is just a given time. One has an output function uh, that can involve these uh, Markov functions. And, uh, and then if we put T equals T0, we're actually back to the problem that we're, uh, the mathematical problem. Next page, please. Uh, next page. Um, and so for a viscoelastic, U, t, U of t is the imposed average field, V of t is the resultant shear stress, for example, uh, in the composite, minus that would be in phase two. And, uh, um, and then our output function is this sort of uh, difference then in the Fourier domain. Um, next page, please. And uh, anyway, everything sort of goes through. Next page, please. And uh, you can sort of extend this analysis to include moments. And uh, again, everything is pretty straightforward. And next page, please. And, uh, and then in many systems such as viscoelastic, it's only the real part of V of T that has direct physical significance. And then that can be handled by adding uh, the ZK, their complex conjugates. And that uh, enables one to get uh, better results. Next page, please. And so here are just some sort of examples using this theorem. And uh, so here is this uh, input function at the top. Uh, it's sort of uh, uh, it's basically the input function that the theory demands, um, and uh, with this uh, input function, so it's clearly not single frequency nor heavy side, but with that input function, the bounds do collapse. Next page, please, as shown in the last figure, um, and and here's another example too. You can collapse the bounds. Next page two. And uh, a related problem you can solve is that uh, um, you can uh, uh, tailor an input with m minus 1 frequencies so that the output re reproduces the response at the nth frequency. And here is an example. The blue curve is the uh, response at a single frequency. It doesn't look time harmonic, and that's because it's a complex frequency. Um, but you can sort of see at uh, time t equals zero, uh, the uh, uh, response of the red curve, so there's the sort of upper lower bounds of the response, coincide with the response of the blue curve. Um, next page, please. And then there's sort of a further extension here to the case where one has uh, um, matrix your operator valued um, functions and you're interested in the resolvent and uh, everything carries through. Um, so the next page is a uh, simulation, uh, but I, th I think uh, it's going to, it's not going to work. Um, I mean, you could, I th yeah. Oh, actually, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> so this is the sort of matrix case. Um, and uh, you can see as uh, uh, time goes on, uh, so the blue region is actually sort of uh, bounds uh, that uh, um, the, so the response of any geometry must lie within there. The two coordinates refer to the stress. Um, so you can sort of think of the stress as being vector valued in the electrical problem, this would be directly analogous to the, say, the average current. And uh, um, so their average current, as uh, time goes on, uh, can sort of uh, point in different directions. And so that's why this is uh, a region. Next page, please. And that's it. 
so here's a couple of references. Um, as I said, that uh, uh, I didn't cover the case where one has the inclusion in the body and wants to determine its volume and shape, but uh, uh, you can read that in these references. Um, there's an earlier reference with uh, um, Ornella and myself uh, that's in my um, 2016 book or our 2016 book on uh, extending the theory of composites to other areas of science. And uh, uh, so there's a chapter there that uh, deals with this problem, but not of designing the, um, uh, the input fields. Anyway, thanks very much for your attention and sorry for the uh, mess up. Um, I guess uh, one thing that didn't download properly is there's a uh, picture on an earlier slide with the um, uh, all with the lens shape regions and the uh, laminate geometries that Christian had found, and uh, I guess that didn't have time to download. So maybe if we could go back to that slide, if possible. Um, I think it may be here, um, or maybe it's the next one. I don't know. Uh, sorry. There should be some arrows going towards those red points. No, it'll be after that. Maybe it's the next plate. No, maybe here. Somewhere there's, if we wait long enough, the uh, uh, things should come. But anyway, let's take questions, I guess. <laughs>